All right. Oh God! I need ammo. I'm drifting. You're not drifting. Uh, you just, just made sounds. I swear to God. You're just sitting just in place. A long way from Tokyo. This is future Tokyo. Just, just a little. Where in the mission do we actually have to be? It's not. How does one sit again? Gotcha. Shift wow. click on the marker for squad leader training on the map. It will teleport you. What a sh it's, it's the fucking future and there's no access to fucking disabled people. I'm gonna sue their ass. Fuck is this? He'll sit next to me. Oh, I can't be seen with this guy. He's not tactical at all. I'm stuck in the stairs. I need an adult. <laughs> That's a good meme. You can be the buffer. Just shift click a little bit of a different place on the map. You'll get through. Or do that. No! Well, if they weren't here, they wouldn't be able to answer you, would they? This is gonna be so much fun. Oh, Jeffy I thought you meant on Draxel, what are you guys doing? I don't know. Let's get this. Oh, okay. Right, how do I put down my weapon when I'm sitting? How do you pull out your weapon when you're sitting? No, just did it automatically. Sorry. Okay. How do you do it? Oh, there we go. I figured it out. Just We're control S or W. That's how I do it. That doesn't do shit. Control edge. I don't fucking know. Oh, who should I sit with? Hey! That's your first one. I don't know anyone here. <laughs> what? That's the point track. What, what's your first one? Oh god! What's oh, my first I can't stop! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you mean my persona? Yep. You're in the room. Well, I guess I, I saw him with Rook. Not a fairy. Go sit with Rook. He's going to sit with Rook. Oh, hey, Rook. Hey, Drexel. Am I floating? Oh, oh, I floating? Yeah. oh yeah, I am. Let's back up a second. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Alright. Seven. And it's filled with autism. It's like a bunch of pages long and overly detailed, but it has a lot of useful information in it. It'll go into detail on like the the theory of things, not like the details of things, because we do things obviously differently than Shack Tack does. But it's a good resource for information. Fortunately, a lot of new people don't really know about that, but that's that's a good place to start. So that's where I'm going to be basing a lot of this uh, starting stuff from. I'm not doing this like, I don't know, a uh, very organized or professional way. I'm just, I'm just going to start talking and see where it goes. A lot of you guys are not new people. You're just here because you want to be here. That's right. Yeah. All right. Well, the first thing I have to go over is uh, the first thing you would do when joining it up. It's like picking a role. You get into the lobby, a mission has been selected, where do you start? What do you want to do? The thing is, uh, a lot of people like to pick one thing and then they had a good experience with it, so they just keep like replicating it over and over and over. Like one person does a medic and then, you know, does a good job as a medic and then they don't want to do anything else ever. But that's it's not a good way to look at things. Uh, you should definitely try to be diverse in what you're trying to play as. Because it's good if you're, like, specialized in one role and you're particularly good at it or whatever. But if you don't know how to, like, read a map, even though you're, like, the best medic of all time, then you're not worth anything. You're useless. Get out of here. But uh, if you, you know, jump around between 
every once in a while being like a team leader, a medic, uh, auto rifleman, AT, you know, doing all of the roles independently. You might not be the best at every one of them, but at least you know the basic knowledge, working knowledge of how to be any of those roles. That's a lot more important than specializing in just one. So that's the that's the first thing. The next thing is uh, when you get into the game to remember what your role is and like what it means. If you're a medic, it it means I mean like the next thing you would look at is what squad are you in? Are you in an infantry squad like Alpha Bravo Charlie kind of thing? Are you in like a, a command? Are you a command medic or something like that? Because a command medic would be pretty different from a Alpha Bravo Charlie kind of medic. You have to look at what kind of squad that you've joined. If you're in an infantry squad, you can probably assume that you're going to be doing pretty much anything, but mostly doing like an assault type of thing. I mean, obviously that could change depending on the objective or what the commander wants you to do. But most of the time you're going to be going into places and like shooting things or defending things, whatever. But if you join command or something like that, your job is going to be quite a bit different. As a command medic, you're usually not needed most of the time unless it's like a dire situation or something along those lines. So you're not going to see a lot of action, so you shouldn't expect to. Uh, the other thing would be something like a support squad, if there's like a, uh, a specialty kind of thing for just medics or for support kind of things in general, like engineering and medics. That kind of thing would be pretty similar to command, but you can expect to be used, you know, you can expect to get in there and do your job. That's just, that's just, uh, you know what I mean. If you pick your role, look at what squad you've joined and see what kind of role it is, if that's what you want to play. The important thing is to be good at everything and not just specialize in one thing. The next thing you would look at is to, is to memorize the name of who your squad leader is. And if you're in a larger squad, who your team leader is, or at least who the team leaders would be, if there would be two of them. Because once you get in game and you can't remember what your role is, or you can't remember what squad you're in, Alpha Bravo or Charlie or something, you don't remember who your squad leader is, you don't remember who your team leaders are supposed to be, it just slows things down in the beginning. If you don't remember right off the bat, then just go into your map screen, go to the team roster, and then look for your name. You might not be able to tell exactly what squad you're in, like Alpha Bravo Charlie or whatever, but you can get a good idea of what's going on, and that will speed things up. Let's see. The next things would be, say you joined a squad like a uh, weapons team. Like a weapons team squad, you know, as an example, say it's like five or six people or something like that, and you've got AT and machine guns or something. You would expect to be maybe alternating between an assault role and like a support role, depending on what you're being called out to do or command wants you to do or some shit like that. So maybe you're going to be treated as a normal squad, you, even though you you know pick the biggest machine gun you could pick. Doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be using it with free reign on any enemy you see. Uh, if the commander wants you to just stay back and you know be there just in case they come across armor that they can't take care of with their little puny uh, squad AT weapons or whatever, that's what you're there for. That would be a supporting role. But if the commander says, hey, you're taking a different angle than Alpha and Bravo are taking, you're taking the weapons team angle, you know, you're approaching from the west when everybody else is approaching from a different angle, then you could expect to be a full-on assault. But my point is just if you if you join a team like that, you know, know what your squad is kind of supposed to be doing. Uh, the other thing would be recon team. Uh, people play recon team like uh, I don't even know what the impression was that started it off here in A3G, but recon doesn't really do recon here much anymore. But I'd like to see that change. Uh, Recon is mostly just meant to be, obviously, reconning things, observing things, marking things, calling things out, that type of thing. But what it kind of divulges into in A3G more often than not is, like, the marksman team. They just get into contact first and snipe out what they can and shoot as many people and then die and complain. But the point is, uh, recon team is not supposed to see too much action. They're supposed to see a lot of people and a lot of things but not engage in combat directly themselves, at least at first. If it's, a, if it's a type of recon team that specializes like a 
special forces team or something like that, then yeah, maybe you'll get called in to do an objective on your own or something like that. But if you're slotting as a recon role, don't expect to be put into the, you know, Rambo kind of thing where you're sitting first and you're the elite squad or whatever. You're there to be the, uh, that like premier pushing squad that goes in and sees what's out there so that you can help everybody else. You're not just out there to go on your own. So what squad you join is important. I think that's all I'm covering on the, the beginning part, like picking a role. Because that's where you start. That's how you get in the game. Any questions? Idea. What? You just need to give out random roles to people. If you just that wouldn't be a bad idea. A I mean, you don't want to do that all the time, Are but that would be kind of a neat that? idea for... Uh, uh, like, the way that TVTs work, because that's a good way of doing it. You don't want to spend too much time, oh, I want to be with this guy or whatever. It's a random I'm... placement with TVTs. But if it's an op and a mission, you know, maker says, I want to do this for mine or whatever, it might be kind of a neat idea to spread people out and keep them away from people that they're so used to being with. I don't know, I wouldn't be opposed I'm to gonna seeing something like that. Can I speak up on this? Shut up, Rook. Fuck you. What do you have to say, Rook? I think that's an. I think that is such an offensively stupid idea. I can't believe anyone's entertained. Okay. Like, yeah. why would why would I play ops if like I want to play a specific role, whether it be squad leader, whether it be rifleman? You like, don't, say you I'm don't having need a bad to get day. too upset. I don't want It was just an it idea. It's a pretty not shitty for an idea. overall thing. Fuck you, Pansy. Okay, well, especially for TVT. Like, do you want <laughs> right. do you want TVTs to remain like chaotic and nobody ever listens? Yeah, let's randomize the roles so that nobody ever gets what they want. Like whoa, TBTs whoa, are whoa, bad whoa, enough. Whoa, whoa, like, whoa, Rook! I want TBTs you need to calm to get down a little bit here. Calm down, like, take a breath. Shit. I am arguing. Nobody is like, upset here except for you. You're saying something stupid. The idea of it is not stupid. Just yes, like there are like hundreds of I'm gimmick arguing. missions and there are missions that specialize. Saying, okay. Calm down, Rook. Calm let's down. let's skip this. Obviously, you can't get past this one. Let's go on to the next topic. Because you won't argue it. You just said I'm not here to argue. Good. I'm just here to inform, man. I don't want to argue with you. Then you know you're right bullshit. about everything. I think it's an interesting idea, but not in TBT. Volker. This, this is not an information making forum here. We're just here to talk about basic training. Please don't divulge. R R Ruck, don't say your opinion in the off. Steph, you might get upset. Wow. Steph can go fuck himself. Wow. Look, what is wrong with you, man? Yeah, fuck you, Seth. Get, Get on with it. <laughs> All right, let's let's go to the next topic. Do so I have to think. start recording this? Yeah, Hold I'm already on. recording this. The oh, the the wow. first part that we covered would be uh, selecting a role. So the next thing would be, what do you do as soon as you spawn? Quit throwing fucking grenades. So you you've just spawned in, whether you're before or after everybody else. What's the first thing you do? That's completely up to you as far as you know what you tackle first or whatever. But the way I usually do things is the first thing I do is I set my radios to the specific gear as soon as I spawn. If I'm a squad member, then I immediately hit uh, what's the key? Alt left arrow or control left arrow. That puts my short range radio on my left ear because I know I'm about to get hit by a flood of you know a bunch of people talking on channel one for short range because nobody selected their specific channels yet. So it's all going to come pouring in, and you know it comes out of the left ear. You know what to expect it. The, the, the next thing you do right after that is, you know, whether... If you're a basic rifleman or something like that, you can turn your volume down quite a bit on the short range if you don't want to, like, listen to these people and stuff. Then you designate what channel you're supposed to be on. You know, if you're alpha, you're typically channel 1, bravo 2, etc. You know, talk to your squad leader to figure out exactly where you're supposed to be going. And then another thing that we have to do kind of nowadays uh, with the implementation of TFR and a lot of people not knowing how to do the module correctly, you have to check your, your frequency to see if everybody's on the right frequency. You might be on channel one frequency, you know, 500 or whatever, and then the guy next to you is on channel one frequency 22 or something like that, even though they both say channel one. And that's, uh, that that's up to the mission maker. Sure, some people know how to do it, but it, we encounter it a lot more often than we should. So it's something you should be prepared for. 
if your uh, if your frequencies don't match up with the person next to you, talk to your squad leader and figure out where you're going to be. That's very important. That's like the first thing you do when you get into an op. Not just run to an ammo box and see what's inside. I know the the lure is there. It's trying to bait you in. But the first thing you should do is get your comm set up. The radios are very important. Uh, the next thing, obviously, after you get your radio set up is probably to run to the box. You typically spawn with everything that you're going to need most of the time. Unless it's some kind of specialty situation like a jiffy mission where you don't spawn with any ammo because he has virtual ammo box <laughs> or say you're a medic and you didn't spawn with uh the necessary stuff that you'd want say like a mission maker had a like a, a loadout script or something where you had a custom backpack but they didn't bother to give you everything that you would need in the backpack or something's missing or something like that then that's a situation where you would gear up a little bit but that's a little bit more specific. For more general things, say you're like a regular rifleman or something like that, you don't need blood bags. If anything, you need maybe one EpiPen. But as a, as a rule of thumb, what I do typically is have about five bandages and maybe two morphines. And that means basically like two first aid kits. If you grab a first aid kit, it will transform into something like two bandages and a morphine. So, like, two first aid kits would give you, what, four bandages and two morphines, which is just about enough. You really don't need much more than that. If you need anything more than that, then your medic in whatever squad you're in would typically cover you. So if you run off to the box, like a medical box, and you're a rifleman or some kind of regular role, not a medic, and you start grabbing bunches of epi and blood bags just to be the first ones there to grab it, that is not a good thing. It's a terrible habit. Medics get really pissed when you do that. Because it's later in the op, when, you know, blood supply is running low, or epis are running low, people go back to base to try to find more. They can't find it. Where is it? Nobody knows. And then after, like, the op is almost over, they find some dead guy on the ground, some dead friendly, disconnected 20 minutes ago, and he's got 10 blood bags and 50 epis in his backpack. That happens a lot more often than it should. But that's, that specific situation is more like griefing. But that does happen quite a bit where people will grab something like five epis and two blood bags as a rifleman or a grenadier. And it's completely useless to them. The medic is supposed to cover that for everybody. And if the medic doesn't have enough, then they're going to resupply somehow. But that's on them. You shouldn't have to worry about that. All you need to know is that you need something around five bandages, maybe two morphine. So after you got your medical supplies, then it depends kind of on your role. If you're a uh, like a basic rifleman, you know, it depends on how many magazines you want to carry with you. If you're a grenadier, you got to divvy it up between an amount of magazines and an amount of grenades to carry with you. Uh, if you're a, a machine gunner, an auto rifleman, something like that, you got to kind of divvy up how many boxes or belts or whatever kind of magazines you're carrying with you. And then your basic supplies on top of that. And then hopefully maybe you'll have an ammo bear or uh, an assault uh, assistant, assault rifleman or whatever. Or you know, somebody to carry your shit for you. So you essentially double your ammo count without actually having to carry things. But that's where you communicate to whoever's in your squad. Because you're working as a team there. The ammo bearer's job is is pretty important. It doesn't come into, into play a lot uh during some of our ops, because people like to barbie up with the boxes. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be prepared for it. Uh, if you run out of ammo, you shouldn't be running straight over to a dead enemy body or something and trying to pick up their gun. Your first reaction should be to try and find an ammo bearer or asking your squad leader. And if it's a, a situation where a lot of people in the squad are low on ammo, then the squad leader will ask somebody else, like a different squad or command or support, something. A lot of ops uh, have those kind of situations going. And a lot of people like to run straight to enemy bodies and pick up the machine gun versus their MX or something like that. It's just terrible practice. Oh, where am I? If I can just yeah. say one thing, Doc. What? What? Uh, what? You cover things to do, you know, after the game starts. There's just one thing I'd like to point out what not to do when a game starts. Uh, a lot of vehicles will have, uh, I'm sorry, a lot of missions will have vehicles in them and whatnot. 
when the mission starts, a lot of drivers and gunners like to run over and jump in their vehicle and start doing donuts or just fucking around. It's not cool to do that because a lot of times squad leaders, commanders, they're trying to communicate and get organized. And again, like, like you know, Duck said, squad members are trying to communicate, figure out what kind of radios they're on, what frequencies. And it's hard to do that when you've got helicopters or tank engines going on in the background. You don't need to start your engines up until you're ready to move out. So, you know, just as, you know, something nice to the people around you, don't do that. Yeah, that's uh, that's something we could cover a little bit more in a like a specialized kind of thing. But yeah, say you've got Humvees or it's a convoy mission or something like that. Uh, the the engines on Humvees usually aren't too bad, but avoid starting the engine until you've got a reason to, until you got a reason to move or something like that. There's just there's no reason for it. Uh, it creates distractions and unnecessary noise and stuff like that. And in the days of Krusty, if any of you guys remember that. He would always run straight to a helicopter at the beginning of a mission, start it up, and just do spirals right around the spawning area to create as much noise and distraction as possible. And the only way to make him stop is if you confronted him, if you told him to land and turn off the engine, because otherwise he thinks it's free game. You can do whatever you want unless they tell me not to. What the fuck was that? That was just a jet. Honda doing was what Krusty jet. was doing. Anyway. <laughs> Krusty is banned now, so don't do that. <laughs> but the point is, yeah, if you are if you spawn in as a tank or something like that, don't start the engine yet and start moving around. If you're a pilot, don't start flying around or whatever. Just try to stay organized before the thing starts. Just stick with your squad or whatever. Or be ready to move out. Don't just act like you're in a TeamSpeak lobby or something like that in the game. Uh, like I was saying earlier, just kind of slows things down and gets people distracted and makes it tougher for squad leaders to make sure that everybody in their squad is where they're supposed to be when they're supposed to be there. Just shit like that. Uh, the next thing about uh, inventory management, like picking shit out of the boxes, is keeping your eyes on you know, how much weight you have. Which is, say, if you open your inventory, thanks, I'm going to stand up. The bottom of your inventory bar has that white bar that goes from left to right. The further that goes, the more shit you're carrying, the faster you're going to lose stamina. You don't want to do that. A lot of people don't make a big deal out of stamina because they are used to it or something along those lines at this point. But stamina is a big deal. If you're doing some kind of, uh, some kind of op where you're walking a long distance and people are kind of running around because they're impatient about the walking distance, they start running low on stamina, and then all of a sudden they take contact from somewhere and they can't aim, or something along those lines. They're not used to, they get so tunnel visioned on moving forward that they don't look around for contacts and they start getting shot at and things just become panicked really fast. It could all be avoided pretty quickly by just carrying a normal load of stuff, not just maxing out your, your vest and your backpack and whatever to your maximum levels. It's just not necessary. If you're a regular rifleman, you don't need to carry 20 magazines. 10 is all right, but, you know, 20 and over that is just absurd. SUD Russians disagrees. Question. I actually added weight to those. It's coming in the next update. <laughs> well, we got rid of, of SUD outdo- Russians, didn't we? You'll notice a lot of things in the content pack uh, are kind of not matching up. And that's because all the mod makers are obviously independent. They don't, like, talk to each other and stuff. And some of them kind of do their own thing. They don't say, hey, here's vanilla stuff. We're going to make it close to that. So, yeah, sometimes you might pick up a gun that weighs uh, relatively, you know, something like uh, the amount of weight of a rock. And sometimes you might pick up a gun that you can barely pick up or something like that, you know, weighs a ton. There's discrepancies all over the place. I'm working to fix some of those things, but you can expect there to be problems. What? Uh... Did we remove the SUD Russians? No. We still have the guns. We, we, we still have, have guns as well as RHS? <laughs> yeah, there's there's stuff in SUD Russians that aren't in the other things. Quit fucking around, Jesus Christ. You don't think so I have eyes on the back of my head? have any of the new modern AKs or the ASVAL or the VSS. Basically, RHS is garbage. Yeah, RHS wow. is lacking a lot of uh, Russian weapons at the moment. They, they really have just one AK with like 10 camo variants. Oh, yeah, that's right, that's right. 
All right, let me get back on point here. Oh, that's a really important one. So one of the things you do when you're first spawning in, make sure you're right on the right channel. You can do that on the briefing screen, which is the screen right before you spawn into the game. Uh, to change your chat channel, it is comma and period. And you'll see it switch between, you know, global, group, all that kind of stuff. Uh, a lot of it is self-explanatory, but some people don't connect the dots. Group chat means it only applies to people who are in your group, in your squad, whatever shows up in your in the bottom of your screen for your Shack Tech HUD or who you join the game with. So if you want something on the map or, you know, maybe text chat if you like to cheat uh, just to your group, then that's how you would do it. And that's the, if you need to type something, that's typically the best way to do it. You don't want to be spamming stuff on side chat and global unless it's very important. Uh, typically you want to be on side when you're, when you're starting up the game and that's like your basic kind of thing. Usually that's the only channel you have to worry about, but because of a marker system that we use, we have to do one extra step. Wait, did somebody say they have a question? Karnikov, go ahead. Karnikov did. Uh-huh. Uh, Are you eating something? Well, I was because I didn't oh. know how long it was going to take till you got to me, but, um, What's your stance on the whole running with binoculars thing if you're over encumbered? Uh, that, that totally depends. <laughs> I mean, th this is a video game. Obviously, there's video game mechanics. So things like running with binoculars, using only like 5% of the stamina you would normally use with running with a weapon out or something like that, that's not a bad thing. But you obviously don't ever want to do that when you're in combat or something like that. It's a terrible idea in combat. Unless you're like the last person alive and you're just a little bitch that's gonna run away. That works really well. But uh, yeah, say you're, you're a commander or something like that. You're constantly using binoculars. You need to move from point A to point B. There's no helicopter or vehicle or something to take you there. You gotta run there, say it's a kilometer. Just get you and your guys to pull out your binoculars or put your weapon on your back and just sprint there, whatever. Sprint. No harm, no foul. Usain Bolt. That's my stance. <laughs> But if you're like an alpha squad and you're supposed to be assaulting at the, like a town or something like that and you're, you know, 300 meters away and there's a giant open field and instead of like taking the, the route that would be longer but give you cover, instead you just bust out your binoculars and everybody in the squad sprints across an open field, that's stupid. Don't do any shit like that. That's just a mistake. But otherwise, yeah, it's a what if it viable works? tactic. All right, to get back on the channel thing, the chat channel is for text chat, and that's like if you hit the comma button, that will enter the text chat. You can type messages. Side would show up for everybody in your faction, you know, say Blue 4, or Op 4, or whatever. Global would show up for everybody on the server. Uh, vehicle would obviously only show up for the people that are in the same vehicle as you, whether that be helicopter, or plane, uh, you know, car, something like that group we already talked about command is kind of a specific channel you might not always see that one that's going to be typically just for squad leaders or quote-unquote group leaders whatever is placed down for the mission maker and then the commander himself so to, sometimes that's a good uh a good route to go if you need to put down markers and you don't want to have people messing with them not everybody can get onto the command channel but typically all you have to worry about is side chat the next step after that is to uh, put down markers on the map, you know, waypoints for yourself or for your group or something along those lines. And recently we started using sweet markers and they had like an update or something along those lines that caused it to start on the wrong channel. So what you need to do if you want to put a marker down on the map so that everybody can see it is to open your map, double clicking would put, put down like a typical marker. But instead of hitting enter to actually place down the marker, you hold shift and press arrow key left or right, and that will switch channels for the marker. And you'll see it do that. It'll say, you know, side, global, all that kind of stuff. And you just want to make sure it's on global or side before you really start getting into the op. Because it's really easy to skip that step and start going through the op, have problems come up later, and you're trying to mark your position or, you know, tell somebody in a different squad something, and they can't see anything you're marking, and you can't tell why. 
That's a pain in the ass. And then you got to explain this whole process to them because they don't know. So make sure you do that as one of the starting steps with your radio and your inventory stuff is to be on the right channels. And you just don't have to Did you talk about... Did, uh, sorry, I stopped paying Go attention. Ahead. Did you talk about the channels for map markers, the new ones? Wow. Rook, are you serious? Yes. Well, literally, the new fucking map markers. just said that. All right, so I said I wasn't paying attention. As, as soon as I talk, stopped talking about it, you asked me about it. <laughs> the the map ones specifically, though, not just the chat chip ones. Yes, that, that's the most important is the okay. map one, because a lot of people have problems with that. But yeah, just try to keep that uh, in mind when you're starting it up. Try to get used to it. You know, putting your radio on the correct ear, getting on the correct channel or frequency if need be, uh, getting your... Uh, your chat channel and your marker channel in the right place. You can do those in the briefing screen before you actually spawn, which is where I recommend doing it. And then, uh, yeah, that's that's a good startup. It'll get you going in the right place. Now, as far as how you manage your inventory, it's kind of up to you as far as like uh, where you put things. But the way I do things is I typically keep the smallest stuff in the uh, in my uniform, and that's things like. Uh, smoke grenades, AGM accessories, like uh, zip ties Map or something tools. like that. Map tools, yeah, exactly. Stuff like that, chem lights. <laughs> all the small stuff that you can spit, uh, fit a lot of, put it in your in your uniform. The way we used to do it with Acre 2 is I would uh, I would put the radios in the uniform as well, just because you know, it keeps it out of the way. But that's where I try to focus that stuff. It's a small inventory space, so you put small things in there, so you don't have to worry about it. The next thing is the vest. You typically have a vest. I uh, I like to put all my ammo in there. All my regular rifle magazines, my pistol mags if I have any. Sometimes my grenades if I can fit them, or if you're a grenadier, obviously you throw them in there too. This is all up. Oh, oh, awesome. This is all up to you as far as like what you want to put and where you want to put it. Yeah, I'm gonna kick you if you keep that up, man. It's an epic meme, but it's not the best. Uh, yeah, anyway, the vest is where I like to keep ammo focused. And it's it's not a, exactly important how you manage it, but it's a good way to uh, to keep things organized. So if, if you're missing something or you want to know if you have a certain number of something, you know, check the right place where you normally do it, and you've got it all set up. The most important part of it about the inventory management is your backpack, if you have one. Jesus Christ. I like to put, uh, if you are a specialty role, like an engineer or something along those lines, AT, put the AT ammo or your toolkit, if you're an engineer, in the backpack. Just because, Just that's because typically where that's you're going to put it because, it because it's the largest space. Like space. Volker. Volker. Hot mic. McVolker. Jesus Christ, man. Ow. Anyway, I'm glad I'm far enough this. to not hear him. Yeah. The, I like to put the special, specialty stuff in the backpack because that's uh, where a lot of it will only fit. But the most important part about it is your medical stuff. I like putting the medical stuff in your backpack if you have one. That way, if you go down and it's a last case scenario, somebody can access your backpack and get the supplies they need. Say if you're a medic or something along those lines, and another medic comes to pick you up, but they don't have Epi, or, well, that's not a good uh, example, but they need, say they need to borrow your Epi, or, or well, let's say, let's say blood bags. Say everybody is out of EpiPen, so you can't just pick up the other medic as a medic, but he needs to get your blood bag so he can give blood to command or something like that before he dies and bleeds out. He can open up your backpack even if you're unconscious, grab a blood bag if he really needs one, run over and do his job still. And that will help a lot. But if you have your uh, medical supplies in your vest or your uniform, uh, nobody can get to them, even if you're down, that kind of situation. And that's, you know, not always a terrible thing, but if you have important supplies or if it's a, a worst case scenario, it's just good practice to have it in your backpack if you have one. Let's see, what's next? All right. As far as the ammo boxes are concerned at the beginning of missions, uh, 
Most of the time you spawn with pretty much everything you're going to need for the mission. Typical loadouts are what, like, seven or eight magazines for a typical rifle. That's usually plenty throughout a mission if you, uh, if you control your rate of fire pretty well. If you really feel like you need more than that, you know, that's what the boxes are for. They're for, like, an extra ammo and supply kind of thing. But they're not there to be the basis for everything you're supposed to be carrying. You're not supposed to max out whatever your max load is. It's just not what it was designed for. So it's a it's a good habit to try to keep a minimal amount of stuff. Just throwing that one out there because that's obviously it's up to you what you do. But uh, minimal stuff is is a good practice. All right, what am I doing next? How about accessories? Uh, say things like uh, chem lights, IR. They do provide in like an armor value that t Thomas just takes this way. What? He probably deserves it. I'm moving answer. him. <laughs> How do you use the cable ties? That's that's a good question. Uh, all right. Somebody come Wait. down here. No, why would we need to use him? Why would we need to use You can use him as an example. Well, no, now, why would we? Why would we need to use yes. cable ties? They're just a, a shitter device. Yeah, I'll, what you do is you go up to someone and you use your AGM interact menu. And if you have a cable tie, there will be an option that says "Take prisoner," and it looks like a pair of handcuffs. And you use that, and they put their weapon away, and they lock their hands behind their back, and they can't move. And the only interaction you can do with them is, uh, well, you can still do all the normal stuff, like you can treat them, you can frisk them at their shoulder, uh, you can join their group, but the important ones are you can escort them, like so. Leave me alone, piece of shit. <laughs> hey, also, I, I want to bring, can I bring something that's actually, uh, sorry, what, Kessel? Um... Can you actually disarm them via this? I know you can frisk them, but I don't know if you can actually disarm them. No. Take his pants off! Take your okay. dirty ass off, you piece of shit. Can I, can I bring something up that actually might be cool, since it's a new feature? Uh, now and then you'll find AI now that are unconscious. I'm wondering if we can start taking them prisoner instead of just executing them. Yeah, and then we can all like. <laughs> we have a neck issue over here. But. Did my. Right. Alright, I'll set me cut. free, you piece of shit. Stay away from me, Pansy. You're trying to try and do the same thing. Yo, this, who the fuck handcuffed me? What the fuck? I'm moving, and I'm not moving my shit right now. Somebody's taking you for a ride. Fuck. His neck is messed up so much. Alright, alright. Kurnikov, just hold it there for a second. Uh, Pansy. Like to cover the vet we should, Pansy, would you stand behind switches? the truck? Okay. There. Oh.
Thanks, AGM. Yep. Wait, yes. what? Yeah, I can hear him. I can hear him. What the fuck? I'm stuck in oh, Steffi's wow. hell. I've never... I... Is to zip tie them. If you look... But if you use the zip that. ties, you run out of one zip tie. He gets in a seat, and then he's fine. No, I'll, I'll load it myself, fuck you. Oh, wow. Neat. Yeah. Oh my god, hacks. What's that beeping sound? Concern intensifies. It's a raven. Why are you kind of oh. covered the vector for in the, uh, what is it? What is it called again? The map tools. It does a lot more than just figuring out the Rip range waters. and the azimuth. It can give you a lot of neat information, like the distance between two objects or the azimuth between two objects. Things like that where it can be really helpful. Why does you know, it have a variable zoom? Why doesn't it? Yes. It doesn't? I, I think it does. I don't think it does. What are you talking about, Kessel? I said, why doesn't it have variable zoom? Oh, no, you're right. Yeah, it's got that fixed. I hate that shit. It's a fucking digital optic. So I hate that our regular binoculars are like that as well. A second to get back on topic here. <laughs> Wait a minute. Uh. Of course, somebody else that doesn't have the necessary. As a rifleman, say you get shot in the leg, something like that. You do the self-diagnose with AGM, which I think by default is control windows key, left windows key. Do self-treatment. Diagnosing yourself is instantaneous. So if you are hurt and the medic wants to know what's wrong with you, don't let them, or if they don't have to, just tell them what's wrong with you. Use the instant diagnose and tell them what you need because that will be faster than having the medic diagnose you themselves if they don't have to. Sometimes. Just tell them what's wrong with you, the parts that you need bandaged, and they'll go to town. Uh, I don't know what the exact amount of time is. For diagnosing, you know, it's probably... Obviously, the first thing is it's going to tell you their name, but you should probably already. The next thing is it's going to tell you what state they're in, like if they're unconscious or not. Uh, and it says that by saying, you know.
this situation does not apply if the uh, medical module put down doesn't have like body parts for uh, for healing and stuff like that. It might just say you're bleeding, bandage all the time. What are you doing to me, Pansy? Don't worry about it. Oh, he's gonna overdose me. No. Even worse. What did you just put on the ground? Don't t don't touch it. But yeah, you've got uh, your diagnosis will tell you the body parts. It'll tell you how damaged you are, which will give you an idea of uh, how many bandages you might need if you're heavily injured or lightly injured. Uh, the next thing would be the blood section, and that's going to tell you if you're normal, if it's white. Everything in AGM is white if it's completely normal, typically. Uh, the next part would be, uh, you know, bleeding would be red, and obviously that just means that they need help. They're bleeding out out of a certain part of their body, and you've got to put a bandage on there. This is just basic shit. After it's done, uh, there's a part next to that that will say lost some blood, typically, and it will be yellow. Sometimes you'll be, like, slightly injured at the beginning of an op for no reason. I'm not sure what the situation with that is or why it happens. But if it says you're slightly injured and you're not bleeding, don't worry about it. It's pretty normal. Uh, anyway, I think you can figure most of this stuff out for AGM Medical if you don't have any questions about it. But the important part that I want to get across is the uh, pain effect. AGM has a pain effect. There's two different ones. The default one is like a chromatic abrasion kind of effect where it does like a pulsing rainbowy kind of thing on the fringes of your screen. And that can really affect your... Uh, your vision if you're pretty heavily injured. You know, you might not be able to engage back quite as well if you, I don't know, fell five feet and hurt your foot or something like that, but you're not actually bleeding. You still might not be able to aim correctly because everything's blurry. To really easily get past this, you could use the AGM uh, alternate pain effect, which essentially just replaces it with what sort of Ace had, which is just kind of a flashing white uh, on the sides of your screen to indicate that you're in pain. It's kind of cheating, but man, the AGM gives you the option. Use it. It'll save your ass. To get to that, you hit escape, go to AGM options in the top right. That way, if you uh, if you get heavily injured or you get knocked out or something like that, and the medic you know plops you back up really fast, so uh, you can help your guys in engaging whatever took you out, you'll be able to see it. If you use the regular pain effect, you might not be able to aim very well or figure out what's going on because it's so blurry. So if you haven't already, I recommend switching to the alternate pain effect. All right, give me one minute. AGM medical is pretty iffy sometimes. Sometimes you only have to bandage one leg and both are healed. Yeah, that's why I said the, uh, the yellow and red thing. If it says you're lightly injured on like two body parts, sometimes you'll only need one bandage. If it says you're heavily injured on one body part, sometimes you'll need something like three bandages. You Trash, never really what the fuck know. is that on your gun? You just gotta kind of check it out. As a it's medic, a it's a it's attribute. a good practice if it's red and says you're heavily injured to do two bandages what? and then uh, diagnose again. To figure out if somebody's bleeding or not, you have to re-diagnose after every time you do something. That's the best way to find out. Unless you know that person can actually respond and tell you what's wrong with them, still do a self-diagnosis. But we already talked about that. All right, the next thing is uh, AGM view distance, which isn't actually AGM. That's something we kind of homebrewed here at A3G. It's just a script that's built into the AGM menu. Works a lot better than the one we used to use, but it divides it into three separate categories. You've got, you know, if you're on foot, there's the regular one. If you're in a vehicle, it's all vehicles. And then if you're in the air, a helicopter or a fixed wing, there's that section too. And it's all separated into three categories. Uh, the first one is your like view distance, 
and that basically just renders the terrain in the distance, just the like the shape of the terrain, which helps you for getting like a situational awareness of what's around you, but it doesn't show anything, it doesn't show anything that's on that terrain. It's just kind of like a background. If you have it uh, at a pretty short setting, like if you have the view distance set to a thousand meters or something, everything past a thousand meters is gonna be foggy, just pure fog. It'll help your frames a lot too. But the most important part of it is the object distance. That's what actually renders the things in that terrain view distance. That'll show you the units, the buildings, you know, trees, all that kind of good stuff. The stuff you actually need to see. But that's also the most intensive. If you throw up your, your object view distance to five kilometers or more than that, you can pretty much guarantee a, a considerable drop in frames versus having it at two kilometers or something like that. The fuck? What? Anyway, uh, and then the, the third part of the section is the, it'll say terrain. And that essentially is on the lowest setting that will turn off all of your grass settings and make things look pretty ugly, but it will probably save some frames if you have problems with that. If you turn it up to the maximum, which is very high or something like that, it'll bring in the largest uh, render distance for the grass, which is something like, I don't know, 100 or 200 meters. So you can see grass from that far away. And then on top of that, it's very useful for vehicles or for helicopters or something like that, where you need to see really long distances away, like 1,500, two kilometers, something like that. Because if you're looking that far away and you're looking at a hilltop and you have it on a low terrain setting, you can typically see through the top of the hill to like you might see some floating enemies or floating objects or something like that and that's just because your terrain settings are really low and it's not rendering the entirety of what the hill actually looks like so if you crank up your terrain settings to very high if you're say a tank gunner or something like that and you're trying to engage something that's really far away it will be accurate or at least a lot more accurate than it will be if you have it on low you might be I trying to shoot fish. something through a hill and, you know, be smacking the hill and not understand why it's not hitting it. Same thing applies to helicopters. If you're an attack chopper gunner or something like that, the same rule applies. Let's see. The next thing would be equipment. So wanna, in the question. Oh, go ahead. Who was it? Uh, what are your opinions on usage of the tablet map that's on Shift M? Fuck that. I really don't like that mod. DPS. I don't think it should be in our default mod pack. It's probably going to be pushed to optional pretty soon, but... Which one? Essentially, if you don't know what it is, it's Tau Folding Map. It's been around for a really long time, uh, but in its, I don't know, most recent version or whatever, which has been the past, like, six months or something like that, it looks like a fucking iPad with a map on it. But if you Why don't gone, have then? a GPS, if you just have a map... It will track you on the map. It will like center the map based on where you are. So a lot of people like to cheat and use it as a Ooh. free GPS, basically. Wow, it even tells you what grid you're in. Yeah, it's even if you just have a map, which is just a flat out piece of paper, you've got this Tau folding map mod and it will tell you everything without a GPS. It's not really fair. And I, I mean, obviously nobody's going to force you to not use it because it's in our mod pack but I really recommend not getting used to it. It's just a, a crutch. If you get used to looking at your towel folding map to figure out where you are all the time. Yeah. You were hot micing for Hot mic. Okay. I thought it was in the optional me. mod pack already. What was that? I thought okay, it already was in the go. optional mod pack. It used to be. It's in what we call the optional mod pack, but the optional mod pack has a like a default folder and an optional folder inside it. Uh, and it's in the default folder. So if you're running the optional mod pack, it's running by default. Uh. <laughs> anyway, just uh, obviously nobody's going to stop you from using it, but try to avoid using it as much as possible. It's just a bad habit. So, Why? you know, say in the future... When the mod, I don't know, for instance, doesn't get used on the server, say it's not on the whitelist or something like that, and you've got a map without a GPS, oh my god, what are you going to do? You actually have to learn how to you use the map. It. 
You can make it look like an actual map instead of a tablet. That's what I did. Oh, wow. You can look you at it long enough it? to figure out the settings? Disgusting. <laughs> well, it used yeah, to be a that's, map That's my opinion phone. on it. Obviously, you guys can, you know, use it if you want to. I'm not going to stop you, but I don't like it. We'll frown at you. Yeah. Anyway, back to AGM. The next part of AGM is the equipment part. Whether you, I think it's only for self interaction. I can't really remember. But anyway, it only really has uh, a couple uses. Um, the only really important one, if you're not like an engineer or explosive expert, is locking your backpack. If you're a medic and you're really anal about people stealing your stuff or something like that, you can lock your backpack through that menu so people can't take your shit. But like I said earlier, it's good practice if you're in combat to leave it open. You know, just in case somebody needs your stuff really bad. But yeah, I understand it. It can be a problem with people uh, taking stuff out of your backpack that you don't want them to. If you're like not a medic or something like that. And that's a total viable option to lock your backpack for. So that's just a nice little feature that it has. The other option that's or it. the other feature of the uh, equipment uh, selection in that menu is explosives. That's putting down charges, mines, all that kind of stuff, and then using detonators to set them off. Whether you have like a dead man switch would, would trigger it if you die or went down. Uh, the the hand clicker one, which is uh, pretty short range. Uh, 100 meters. Yeah, it's, it's really small, but it's there for putting off charges. Then there's the big one. I can't remember the name of that. That thing has pretty, pretty good range. And that's the satchel, the clicker. The detonator. Clacker? Not the other one. Fucking... There's the clacker, and then there's like the big fucking meme uh, like TNT plunger. All right. When so will you be able to M57 string together M57 firing device, device, which is the hand clacker. That's the one that has really short range. Somebody said 100 meters. It's, it's, yeah, it's something like that. Then there's the M26, which looks like a big old box, which essentially is what it is. Uh, and I <laughs> so if the dead man switch. So if you're in like a Hot white mess. Hot white mess. So say if you're, uh, you create some kind of distraction as an explosive expert, long enough for you to get a charge on there and you set it up for the dead man switch, uh, which you can trigger remotely, by the way, if you really need to. How? Uh, it's just like anything else, just like the hand clacker. I tried it uh, during Hot White Mess the other day, and it wouldn't let me in. I think Trusty told me you have to die for it to go off. <laughs> it might have a really short range. I don't know. We'd have to test it. I'm, but I'm pretty sure right I've now. used it before to, to make it work. What are you doing up there, Leo? But anyway, yeah, that's a good idea is to bring along one of those things. So that way, if you if you put down the charge and... Uh, you know, you've you've had enough time to successfully put it down. You can just stand right next to it and wait for the enemy to shoot you or something, and that would cause the mission to end in your favor. And that well, hold on a takes. second. But that's a dead good example switches. of what the dead man switch is good for. A, a dead man switch, fucking hell. Dead man switch essentially detonates whenever you let go of it from your hand. So if you actually yeah drop it from your inventory will it go off that's a good question that you would have to test i do not know let me find it out does. right now it does well there you go you can test the range on how far it'll do that and then you'll know uh, are you going to talk about diffusing explosives no i'm i wasn't even planning on talking about explosives in the first place but if oh, you guys want well, it we can talk about it why not uh, the before little... we move on uh, how do you use the map tools? 
Map tools. That just, that just lets you draw on the map, right? Yes. Relative to north to south. You can, you know, double click to make it smaller or bigger or whatever. So open up your map. You'll see where the compass is looking. Uh, close your map, turn a different direction, open up your, your map again, and you'll see the compass is facing a different direction. That's a really quick and easy way to just figure out what direction you're looking. The map tools does this. I don't I don't see my map tools or my compass on my map for some reason. Uh Compass you should have. Maybe it might be off in like the corner of your screen, hidden or something. Interject for a moment. The map tools isn't on the map by default. When yeah, I'm talking about screen, your compass. Use your self interact. Oh, you're talking about the whole. You're talking about the map tools. Not yet, man. Not yet. The access the map tools from your self interact while in the yes. map. Make some mittens. Why don't you just do my job for me, mittens? Sound like you didn't know. You, if you have the, you, you got to grab it, put it in your inventory. And when you open your map, you can self interact, go to map tools, which will be on the top of your screen. And then, uh, you can enlarge it, it has two different. Besides how to get it started, but I'm sure somebody else does. Wait, wait, wait. How do you bring up the map tools on the map again? Okay, get the object, which... Uh -huh. Just say map tools, just throw it in your inventory or whatever, it doesn't matter. After you've got it in your inventory, open up your map, and then use self-interact with AGM, which is what control uh -huh. Windows key by default. And then you'll see an option that says map tools. You select that and you've got two different versions, normal and small. Small should bring it up somewhere. You might have to zoom out really far. It might put it on zero, zero on the map, which would be the bottom left corner. And that'll put it at a, uh, a pretty good size and you can just drag it around. And I can't remember the exact controls for it. It was like shift something or something like that. I don't know. You can, anyway, you can rotate the map tools depending on where you are. And then there's the larger version of it, or normal, which will make it just a lot bigger. Anyway, I'm not the expert. But it is useful. You can use the interact key again once it's up to align it to whichever way you're facing if you have a compass. Yeah, there you go. Align north, align to compass. Compass would be going in the direction that you're facing. And then you can center it around your person or something along those lines, and then uh, figure it out from there. Hold on shift and then left click to uh, rotate. There you go. Now you guys know more than me. Anyway. Oh, shit. Also, I tested out the dead man switch does not go off when you drop it. Right. But you can yeah. trigger that close range. You can trigger what it. What a piece of shit. You so can trigger it, but you, you... you gotta be really close. You gotta be like within 50 yeah. meters. Why wouldn't you just use the, like, the clackers? Uh, it's. I, I brought Fun. up this situation of the TVT, which would be like the best example of why you would use the Dead Man Switch. Say so you can't get yeah. a far enough distance away from the explosive you put down, or maybe you, you think you might be in a situation where you might get killed as you're putting it down. Then yeah, uh, that makes sense. That would be yeah, a good use for it. Versus if you have a clacker and it's your only object, you don't have a dead man switch, then you got to get far enough away or you got to kill yourself. And it takes some time to detonate explosives with AGM as well. You've got to go back into the menu the exact same way that you put the God, explosive device awful. down. And it takes a good amount of time to get things detonated. You gotta go to explosives, yeah, yeah. you gotta go to detonate or something like that, and then you gotta select a device, and then you gotta set the explosive, and it just takes time. Versus a dead man switch, you don't even have to think about it. 
Well, right. but you have to die. <laughs> Dying is overrated. It's not a big deal, man. I think you mean underrated in this situation. I'm not even thinking anymore. I'm just talking okay. all the time. You're reading bullet points? Yeah, that's literally what I have. I just made some quick how bullet ma points. How many you got left? I got quite a few, but I don't think I need to cover most of them. Oh, does, does everyone know how to defuse explosives with AGM? It's definitely more of a specialization kind of thing, but I can tell you that 90% of people do not know how to do it. Or at least don't know how to do does it anybody, effectively. They'll always kill anybody, themselves with APs and boundings. Does anybody want to know? I'd yeah. like to know how to do it with uh, bouncing mines. Yeah, if you, you want to do it the to, safe way, just crawl. crawl to everything. <laughs> yeah, crawl yeah, on our... you have to. Uh, you have to crawl, and then you interact yourself, and uh, you go to explosives, and you should have a diffuse option. It's not well, interact with other, it's you self-interact near it, and you right. diffuse it with the wire cutters. Well, that, that's yeah. pretty self-explanatory, but a little disappointing, yeah. because I kind of hope for a minigame. It's it's pretty straightforward, but man, it is kind of its own mini game. If you expect to be able to disarm <laughs> a bunch of mines pretty quickly, you will be sorely mistaken. It takes quite a bit of time if you got to clear part of a minefield for people to get through it. Please knock the shit off, man. For what fucking purpose? Cluster shells. Nice meme. But anyway, yeah. Say you've got to clear something around ten AP mines or something like that. And you gotta clear it so people can get through it. That's gonna take quite a bit of time. Because you gotta be able to disarm one without detonating another one by getting up to it. Then you gotta do the disarm process, and then you gotta go to the next one, and you gotta make sure your guys don't move in at the same time. It takes some time. It is kind of its own mini game. Oh, this white phosphorus is quite disappointing. Anzi, please. Oh, no, there's the white phosphorus. Can't burn Palestinian children There's the white phosphorus. It landed. Yeah. All right, let's continue. The last part of the important things with AGM is just the team management section. That's pretty quick and self-explanatory. If you go to team management, you have the options to join a specific fire team color, you know, red, green, blue, yellow. And that's just self-appointed colors. Typically, your squad leader is supposed to do that for you. But, you know, what if he tells that? you to do it, then that's how you do it. You just go to team management and do it that way. That's also the quick way to uh, leave a squad. Just go to team management and then leave group. Uh, and then the other alternate option is to take control of the squad. You don't typically just want to grab it because you feel like it, but say uh, somebody's got to leave or they died or something like that, then that's the perfect situation why you would uh, step up as the leader. Say you're a team lead and the squad lead just uh, disconnected or crashed or something. Whoa! And there it goes. Nice. So much for the radios. I, like I think that's pretty much everything with HGM as far as what we use for the basics right now. I didn't cover the gestures, but you can figure that one out on your own. Does anybody gestures. have any questions on AGM or the really basic shit that we've covered so far? Did you talk about repairing stuff? She's pony, golden boy. No, I didn't, because I didn't really want to go into too much of the specialty thing. But yeah, we can go over that if you want. Some of the basics. All right, I guess we'll do it. Um, if you're an engineer or repair specialist, uh -huh. your tool is going to be a toolkit. It's typically going to be in your backpack because I think that's the only place it fits. But you need that toolkit to be able to do your job um, quickly and effectively. Otherwise, you're doing the same things that... Um... Think of it like a medic without all of his you know, supplies. Like a medic without blood bags and epi. That's essentially what a repair specialist is without a toolkit. They can still repair things and do it a lot quicker than a normal person, but they can't do specialty stuff like repairing an engine or a turret or a you know, rotor or something like that or anti-torque on a helicopter unless they have a toolkit. you got to have that. Or there's actually an alternative. They can either have a toolkit or a repair truck or a helicopter, repair helicopter, whatever, within 50 meters. Yes, and that's... Uh, 
that's a little different. That doesn't work the exact same way as far as going through the AGM menu. I can't remember what it was. If it's uh, I think it's self interact oh, no, it's when you do it, and you got to like stand in between them or something like that. Yeah, you have to stand in between know. them, but you're interacting the same way. Yeah, that's a lot more specialized when it comes to repairing, but that's how you do it. Hi. If you are not a repair specialist, and say you're in a Humvee or a Hunter or something, and you damage or lose a wheel, all by default, all of the uh, typical vehicles in Arma 3 via AGM will have two objects inside of its inventory. And you got to actually use the AGM interaction menu to bring those up. It's the unload option. But you'll have one jerry can, which will have a tiny little bit amount of gas in it. And the other one will be a spare wheel. And thanks to AGM, every wheel fits on every vehicle. If you have a sports car, you can take a wheel out of that thing and use it on a Hemet. But anyway, you get a free wheel. So you get one, one free fuck up when you're in a vehicle. And uh, to pull it out, you unload the wheel itself. It'll say unload spare wheel. It'll take a minute to pull it out, and it'll put it at your feet when it's done. And then after that, you just leave it on the ground. You interact with the car, repair, wheel. And then you select which wheel you want to swap it out with. Uh, as far as which wheels you should, say if you, if you have a hunter and you went straight into a wall or something, and you lost... Uh, I don't know. For instance, you lost both of right. your front wheels and uh, one of your rear wheels or something like that. You've got one wheel to put on there. The... Oh, shit. Where did he just go? The best case situation mm -hmm. for you as far as what you would do to get the vehicle moving again is to pull that back wheel off that's still on there, put it on the front, and then use the spare and put that on the other side of the front. You're barely going to move, but at least you're going to be able to move. If you have wheels that are lopsided, like say one rear left and one front right, the car is going to act all weird, it's going to start turning all over the place, it's going to be a pain in the ass. So if you're in kind of a dire situation with say an, uh, a Marshall or something like that where there's four wheels on both sides, Try to keep the missing wheels even if you absolutely have to. It will make the uh, vehicle drive more straight instead of turning. But yeah, as a basic person that's not an engineer or a repair specialist, typically all you can do is uh, just wheels. If there's a toolkit, you'll be able to do some more repairs, but it takes a long time for a lot of them to do. Uh, if it is a tank or a tracked vehicle, it will have a spare track instead of a spare wheel. I think that's the basics for repairing. Did I cover what you wanted to know? Sure. Good enough. All right, that's that's just some like basic shit. The next thing we should talk about is uh, the next topic I had to cover was awareness. And that's that's key when you're playing this game is to be situationally aware of what's happening around you. God damn it! Knock the shit off, guys. I didn't do anything yet. <laughs> yeah, I know, Pinsy. I know. All right, the next thing I'm going to... Interaction with Pansy. <laughs> Thank you. I just did that. Come on. You're just up in you, know he was you know he was tied up when you got moved. Let me inject morphine. You would have no idea if an enemy is coming over a hill or, you know, a squad is off in the distance or whatever because you're too busy mic spamming and, you know, I don't know, talking about your waifu or some bullshit. You're not going to notice truck. the details that are happening around you. Implying. 
All right, the, the first thing you should take note of is what faction you are or what you're playing as. Um, you know, every once in a while, there'll be two factions that are cooperating. Informed blue flip. Knock off the fire, man. You're right, man. These training sessions have to be like 20 minutes long so everybody loses their minds. Anyway, factions. You have to take note if you're blue four, op four, in four, or a civilian faction. Sometimes it'll be a co-op between blue four and in four, or you know, occasionally op four and in four, or something like that. But you need to take note of that because if it's vanilla units, you'll know exactly what uniforms you're dealing with, what helmets you're dealing with, what people should look like, what weapons they should be carrying, all that kind of stuff. That is the first thing you should be taking care of because that will dictate whether you're looking at a friendly or an enemy off in the distance. You know, whether that gunfire you're hearing is friendly or enemy. It's sort of difficult to tell with JSRS sometimes because it's relatively new. But if you're using vanilla sounds or something that you're used to, you'll be able to pick up which weapon is firing based off this sound. Sorry, Kessel, won't let me interact with you. <laughs> Another good off, thing man. to notice is that uh, Tracy Collars, uh, red is used for NATO, or west side, green yeah. is usually all four, and uh, yellow exactly. is for end of Why don't you just kick out anyone well, who's not sitting no, well, there? Are, except um, moment, there are mags. Actually follow this, so. it, well, it's different if there's like 556 well, five, and shit, there are red and green tracer 556 five, mags. All, all mags should have all colors. Yeah, that's a good much. point. I didn't think about that one. Tracers is something to take note of. I mean, obviously it could change depending on what the mission maker puts in. Maybe Blue 4 will be firing off yellow tracers or some shit. But by default, Blue 4 uses red tracers, Op 4 uses green tracers, and In 4 uses yellow tracers. And if civilians are using tracers, they're doing something incredibly wrong. <laughs> or right. I don't understand. And they're not civilians. Why can't Blue 4 use blue tracers? I wonder if that's a thing. Blue 4 uses a tracer bright. mag that alternates red, white, and blue. That would be kind of terrifying. Blue tracer? Uh, I was like thinking the op 4 should use Wars op tracers. Like that. Oh, Star Wars, you fucking pew, pew, nerd. Get out of here. Pew, pew. Anyway, Shut they, the fuck up. they use the opposite of their colors. You've got blue, the opposite is red. You've got red, the opposite is, well, green, I guess. <laughs> green. They're wow. kind of, what is it? Uh, not complimentary, but... Uh, I can't remember the fucking name of it. Not the contrast or whatever. Auxiliary? Uh, Red and green are... I can't remember the fucking name. I should. Opposite. Green and yellow are the same way. They're like contrasting colors or some shit like that. I guess the only one that doesn't apply in there is red and blue. No, it's not too. Red and blue are contrasting colors. Like, I don't even know. I'm not even thinking straight anymore. Blue's contrasting is orange. But whatever. Alright, let's go to the next one. Obviously that kind of ties in with uh, uh, IFF, which is identifying friend or foe. Very important. My god, there are so many people that can't do that that are new here. Uh, like we said, the faction is the first thing in identifying whether something is friend or foe. You can almost always tell if they are via their helmet, especially if it's uh, vanilla gear. Like the helmets that all of you guys are wearing by default, it's pretty easy to recognize from very far distances. Even easier is the uh, space kebabs. Nothing looks like space kebabs. Oh yeah. You always know when you're seeing kebabs because of those damn helmets. Nothing else in the content they do pack. Flies. Anyway, if, if you're finding typical kebabs, you can really easily tell based off of their uh, their helmets. The same thing applies to all factions. You just got to use uh, some critical thinking when you're looking at them. Because every once in a while you come across that guy in the tan uniform with a kebab helmet. But, you know, we'll, we'll not mention that. If that guy gets shot, that's on him. Uh, the next thing after that would be, obviously, your uniforms, like what camo you have. We're mostly, uh, we're MTP, which is kind of like a deserty color, sand color. And then the Op4 faction uses some kind of weird hex pattern, which uh, is kind of like 
I don't know, brownish in color with like a hex pattern. It might not be very easy to tell from far away, but if you have like crazy good magnification or something like that, you might be able to tell. That's like the next step in identifying whether they're a friend or foe. Uh, after that, the more obvious ones would be something like what weapon are they carrying? If you can hear the weapon being fired, what does it sound like? That kind of thing. A Katiba sounds pretty different from an MX and they also look pretty different. An AK sounds pretty different from an M4. The M4s from the RHS pack are pretty characteristic in their sound. It sounds like meats hitting or uh, bullets hitting meat, which is was terrible at first getting used to it. Cause it sounds like people getting shot, but you can pretty easily tell it's an M4 shooting. Same thing goes with an AK. You can definitely tell when one of those is being shot because you're so used to it if you play a lot of ops. But that's just a really easy and obvious way to connect the dots as to whether it's friend or foe. After that, it would probably be something like um, if, if there's vehicles in the situation, what vehicles are they? Is it something like a technical, like a UAZ with a gun in the back, or is it a Humvee? You know, quite a big difference between the two of those. Um, if you remember the start of this mission, you start right in front of that like display of vehicles. That's a really good example of uh, the vanilla vehicles and how they differ in shape and size and that kind of thing. Like for instance, the uh, Op 4 has the BTR Kamish, uh, tracked vehicle, pretty damn tough. Looks very, very different from uh, a Marshall, which is the Blue 4 vanilla vehicle. Just sort of its equivalent, even though it's not quite the same. The Blue 4 vehicle is wheeled, the Op 4 vehicle is tracked. You know, they sound very different, they look very different in size, their shape is very different. But you'll see people get them confused all the time. Actually, never mind, I got that fucked up. Is it the, the Marid? Would, the, yeah, uh... the Marid would be the equivalent. But people still get that fucked up all the time. Friendly Madrid. The Marid it's not a Oregon. fucking Madrid, my god. The Marid. Friendly Madrid. 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 Friendly Madrid. Zargabard. Yeah. Zargabard. Black Bast. But anyway, to pick up the details, just obviously, you, you'll be able to tell um, once you get used to it. But to get a quick example of what they look like, just go back to the spawning area, and you'll spawn right in front of the big display of them. It's uh, pretty surprising when people can't call out the differences between them. They'll see something like a, an Ifrit, and they'll call it a tank or something like that. Or they'll see a tank, and they'll call it a who knows what, an APC. And then you'll see people that see, uh, like, Russian BMPs. Oh! And they have no idea what BRDM they are. BRDM a BMP. Yeah, they'll call it all sorts of different things. You never even know. It's a tank! Yeah, the, the important part is, you, if you can't a remember the exact orbit. name of it, it's not important. Uh, that that could be important is, if though. you really do know them, because you might be able to tell what kind of weapons they have. But if you're not sure, just describe it. Is it armored? Is it tracked? Is it wheeled? What kind of turret does it have on the top? You know, is it a long turret? Is it a small turret? A small turret would be something that looks like a GMG. A long turret would be something like an auto cannon or an MBT tank. You know, something like that, or artillery. You just gotta connect the dots, and if you don't know for sure, don't assume that But that's uh, that's a good way of calling it out, because if you're if you're looking at like a marshal, a friendly marshal, and you don't really recognize what it is, and you call it out as a BMP or something like that, people aren't gonna you know question you. They aren't gonna say, okay, well, maybe he's lying, maybe he's retarded, and he doesn't even know what a BMP is. Well, some of you might think that. It depends but... how ridiculous yeah. the claim is. Yeah, say if it, it, it kind of does match up. There are BMPs in the mission or something like that. Maybe there is a BMP. Say it's obscured or maybe behind you're a just tree. Russians. From Enemy your, boat spotted. Uh, yeah, it's, it's obscured behind a tree from your angle. You can't tell exactly what it is. But from somebody else's angle, they call it out as a BMP, even though it's your friendly marshal that just checked in two minutes ago. It's your best friend. 
An I AT team that. says, oh my god, we're here to save the day. We'll, we'll save all of you guys. And they fire out the Titan right at your friendly marshal without knowing exactly what it is. And uh, they'll take the flack for it and they'll say, but, 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 they called it out. Is a BMP, you know, whatever. But they'll probably eat the shit for it. And that could have easily been avoided by that people calling it out, saying it as, you know, it's an armored vehicle behind a tree over here, blah, blah, blah. Describe where it is, how far away it is, and whatnot. And then they'll connect the dots, and hopefully Marshall crew will be say something like, you know, that's us. Why the fuck are you looking at us? Or somebody else will say it, you know, something like that. Or hopefully the team that was, the AT team that was going to shoot it, hopefully their squad leader knows what it is. Yeah, it's just that uh, if everybody does their job, uh, you know, then a lot of mistakes will get avoided. There's, there's bound to be mistakes, obviously, but things can be really easily avoided by not assuming that you know everything. Uh, the next couple things would be the pretty obvious ones. Uh, like if it's if it's nighttime and somebody's got an IR laser on and they're they look like they're putting on some kind of you know rave or something like that, you can pretty obviously tell they're going to be friendly. If they have an IR strobe, they're most likely going to be friendly. There are rare situations where enemies will have uh, IR lasers, but that's I've pretty seen rare. That for a long time. And uh, what what that basically means is you shouldn't assume that all IR lasers are friendly. But it's pretty easy to tell. And that ties into the next one, which is movement. If you can see them moving and you can't tell their helmets, you can't tell their camo, you know, like their uniforms or whatever, you can't even tell their weapons. If they're walking in perfect formation with their weapons up, even though you can't tell what they are, and they all turn at the same time or something like that, you're pretty much guaranteed it's going to be enemies. And, if, and you can do the column with me. You, you don't have to assume that it is enemies, but call it out as that. You know, say you can't really tell what it is, but they're moving in perfect formation. If Weapon you're doing up. a contact report or something like that. Exactly, like these two fuckers right here. I mean, he's walking sideways, which they like never do, but... Yeah, sorry. Actually, they do and sometimes they when they're taking cover behind things. Yeah. yeah, and they do their nice little twitches yeah, the... and stuff like that. But yeah, if you're not yeah, used to it yet, you definitely will line, be soon. Usually. Anyway, if you if you check all of those kinds of things when you're trying to determine whether something is friendly or enemy, you're going to be okay most of the time. If it's something outside those situations where you see an enemy helmet and they're doing this crazy AI movement and you're like, okay, this is definitely an enemy and you call it in and nobody checks out. Do this. And you shoot them and it says friendly fire. That's not on you. You did everything you could. You checked everything you could. You did your job. And that's what it's about. That's pretty much the extent to uh, identifying friendly or foe. Enemy skills use gestures. Really, only. just look for lifelike movement. It's easy. By lifelike means retards. Yeah, that. Well. Sometimes the AI, specifically in urban combat, they move a little different. Like, especially when they're at a corner and they know there's an enemy around the corner. Like, they'll sidestep like this. They move like a player at corners when they're trying to shoot around a corner. It's really weird. Also, they lean around lamps and uh, signs yeah. like this. Always, always use a nigger for cover. Wish we could do the armor two crab walk. And again, if you're not sure about any of these. Somebody else will help you out. That happens quite a bit um, in a, the situations where you don't have magnified optics. Say you got iron sights or you know hollow sights or something like that, but only one person in your squad has binoculars or an ACOG or something. You know, call it out. You see movement over in this direction. You're not sure about it, and then they'll check it out and tell you. All right. 
that. Next. I forget how to I forget how to bring up the options for it. Alt Shift H. So for some it's reason for you are the, one of those. Uh, it, it should be right Alt right Shift H. Oh, I see. Via that menu, you can restart your HUD if something goes, you know, crazy wrong. If people are flickering on your HUD for some reason, or uh, you just change the resolution of your, you know, display. Like, say you made it windowed mode or something in the game, and your thing disappeared. You can restart it, and most of the time it'll come back. It's also the option to toggle the compass. You don't always need that. And then it's got separate modes as well, so you can kind of make it really, really basic on the bottom of your screen, which might make it look a little bit But anyway, the HUD itself is decided, divided into... Too much talking. Divided into three rings. That first ring is 15 meters, the, the darker kind of circle. The middle one is 30, and then the extent, the very far of it, is uh, 50 meters. So that'll give you kind of a, a quick diagnosis of how far away something is, or if you're too close to something, or you know, if you have somebody on the very edge of your shack tack HUD, you know they're, you know, right around 50 meters or so, something like that. If you see somebody on one end of your uh, shack tech hood and it's you know 50 meters away and then one on the other end you know obviously it's 100 meters between you two it gives you kind of a good idea of how far things are away just because they're close to you on the shack tech hood uh, doesn't mean jesus christ doesn't wow. mean that they're right on top of you but if they are right on top of you your icon will change colors But if you're in the group of some sometimes that doesn't matter because you but if you're in a infantry squad you want to avoid that orange uh label kind of thing that's bad 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 i know we do a lot of block fuck it I know we do a lot of blobbing here in A3G, and it's just kind of a natural thing when things are a little bit unorganized, or if you're doing smaller ops. Uh, but avoiding that really tight blob is key. The uh, you know grenades and, and 40 mics and stuff like that are designed for blobs. It is just designed to wreck your shit if you get too close. And the AI is pretty damn good with 40 mics. They may be inaccurate for the first tub bolt, like one or two, but they get it zeroed in pretty fast. So you make your mistake and you make it fast and you fix it. Blobbing is bad. If you want to have an idea of uh, where people should be, say if you know somebody says this fire team needs to be in front of this one or this fire team needs to go over here. If you are split off, like uh, say a fire team is supposed to clear a house or something, and you've got a different fire team that's supposed to be way in the back, and they're still on the shack tag cut for each other. You know, they're still within that 30 meter range. You're probably doing something wrong. You're a little too close. You don't have to be on the shack tag cut for your squad at all times. It's not necessary. It's just an indication of where people are within 50 meters. This guy. What a show off. What a show about, off. I was gonna use the word faggot, but I guess show off is fine. The good thing about TFR is you could be within a 50 meter radius and everyone sounds like they're on global. global. So you don't need to be right 
right on top of it. Oh, that's that that's a hilarious a, joke. It's good that you brought that up. That's something uh, that should be addressed at the beginning of an op. You by default you start at the normal volume setting, and there's three. There's whisper, normal, and yell. If you're a team lead or a squad lead or something like that, or you're off with your own squad and you're not near anybody, set it to yelling. The way TFR works is it drops off really fast uh, once you start getting to the edges of uh, the direct communication range or whatever. And you, you don't want to have to deal with, you know, maybe having a panic situation where you call out a contact or something significant and somebody just over, you know, 15 meters doesn't get to hear you because you're still set on normal. It's just good, a good idea to set it on yelling if you're not around other people. But that being said, don't set it to yell, like yelling right there at the beginning of an op and then run around and start, you know, talking about bullshit right next to command. That's a quick way to, to annoy people. But it is a good idea if you're off on your own and you need to communicate and you don't want to do it over the radio all the time. Yelling is where you want to be. The yelling with TFR is, if you use Daker 1, it's sort of the equivalent to that. To the normal on Daker 1. Alright. Uh, the icons on your Shaktak HUD. Uh, if you're not used to those, uh, by default, I mean, the squad leader is going to have that stripe, a diagonal stripe through him. And there's a couple other roles that will have their distinctive icons on the bottom as well. Those are going to be people like the uh, auto rifleman. He's going to have his arrow. AT is going to have two kind of arrows, side, or, uh, one on top of the other. The medic is going to have his kind of asterisk or his star right in the center of his icon. And then the engineer is going to have his wrench kind of going through. And that's a really quick way to tell if you're a team lead or a squad lead who's in your squad or fire team. So if you've got somebody who's like, uh, I don't know, as an example, a marksman or something like that, he's going to show up, um, same with grenadier, as just a regular dot. So those kind of guys you can treat as riflemen, like regular riflemen. You can kind of spread them around as needed. Uh, marksmen uh, probably shouldn't be at the front if there's any kind of squad like that, but that's something you can cover in, you can cover in squad leader training or whatever. But if you have something like uh, your medic and, uh, I don't know, like an engineer and, uh, I don't know, two machine gunners or something like that, as your assaulting squad taking the lead and you see these guys all going off in the front you know say something that medic should not be up in the front of the pack machine gunners aren't very effective from the very front and an engineer what the fuck is an engi engineer going to be doing up in the front not to say that he can't but he's definitely not his best up there these guys my god Lido, Rorans, and the other fucking guy. Knock this shit off. Just don't fly over us. I don't care if you fly around. Alright. I don't know. I won't go over too much more. We've already been here for a while, but... Really important thing is, uh... Even if your squad leader doesn't tell you to do it, 360 security. Always having your eyes open in every direction. If you're in an area that you know you know might be hostile or whatever, you're gonna have like you want to have eyes in, in every direction from where you are. You don't want to have everybody looking forward. Say you're assaulting from east to west on a town. You don't want to have everybody looking west. You want to have people worst, looking both sides and in the rear too. Go ahead. The worst is when when someone goes down. Everybody looks at the downed guy and not who shot the downed guy. Yeah, that's a good point. Unless... That's fine, like, initially, because, yeah, a guy goes down, you're going to look at him, but immediately try to find the guy who shot him. Don't stare at him while he's down. Cause you're much you're more effective down. to a down guy by taking out whoever killed him rather than stabilizing them. Unless you're in some kind of a buddy team and you're split off from everybody else, and whatever killed you is kind of a one-time thing, you should be focusing on whatever is the, the hostile at the time. Because what's going to stop that hostile from taking you down while you're taking care of your friendly? 
what's going to stop that hostile from taking out five of your friendlies if you know everybody bunches around him as soon as he goes down this it's just useless let the medic do it first if uh if the medic's not around or if it's not a safe situation eliminate the enemy and then pull back the casualty to a safe place so the medic can take care of it just make sure you communicate that you're doing what you're doing you don't need to communicate that you're engaging the enemy still, but you need to communicate if you're going to drag somebody or carry somebody back to a safe place, that kind of thing. And obviously communicate if somebody goes down. That's very important. And when I say communicate, I mean, your first reaction should be to say it verbally, just on direct. But if you do have kind of a split up squad or you know somebody's not going to notice, say it over your short range radio. Make sure your squad leader knows about it. Make sure the medic knows about it if he's not in the immediate area. But you want to say it on direct. If that's not enough, go to the short range. But the initial the point here was don't huddle around dead guys. It won't do anything for them. It's just prone to getting more but dead guys. But it might guys. get you shot. Yeah. Anyway, 360 security. So everybody's going to be looking at the front. Front's probably going to be covered. But the guy who is leading whatever group you're in, fire team, squad, if you're moving as blob or whatever, even a buddy team, one guy is typically going to be covering the front. Depending on the size of the group that you're with, he might be covering like a cone of vision, which might be your front, front left and front right or something like that, up to maybe 45 degrees. That should be their effective area. Kernikov, you're hot mic by the way. Cool. Uh, then after that, you know, you should kind of specialize. You see somebody is looking at the front already. Look to the sides. Look somewhere that they're not looking. Sure, you've got a squad that's looking front and left and right, but nobody's covering the rear. Just do it yourself. Just cover the rear. You don't have to be looking at the front. If you're a marksman and you want to be covering the front uh, on top of whoever the front guy is and you don't want a bunch of other people looking in the same direction, just say it. you got to communicate for other people to understand. They're not going to pick it up on their own. But having somebody looking in at least all four directions, you know, front, back, left, and right, is crucial. It's Otherwise, you're going to get into situations, maybe not inevitably, but, I mean, eventually you're going to get in a situation where... Somebody's going to flank you, or somebody's going to come around a wall on a side that you're not looking at, and instead of getting just one of your guys, or none of them, he might get three or four, or everybody. Who knows? They're just situations that can be really easily avoided if everybody is looking in a different direction. Oops. And I see that happen a lot in um, cities. It's not so bad when we're in like open terrain or whatever. Uh, it does need to improve there, but... When we're in cities especially, everybody's looking down the same street or in the same window or the same house or something like that. You just got to be a lot more careful. Uh, we used to have a mission called uh, Silent Sweep. Oh, and man, that, that mission teaches you a lesson about uh, moving through cities carefully. Every window could be a dangerous spot and every you know corner of a house could be a difficult spot. Every gate opening, every door, all that kind of stuff. You just got to keep that in mind. And when you're in a city, there's a lot of those things. So you want to definitely keep the 360 security. One thing for urban combat is, like, if you're in a squad and you all are up against a wall, like, stacking up to go around a corner, if you're the last one in that line, look behind you. Look the other way. Because everyone else is looking front. And you're at the end. You have the best line to, the, to rear. Uh, your rear. Look rear. Yes. Your formation can dictate which way you look in certain situations. And the other thing on top of that is if it's not your job to look at the rear, but that rear guy isn't looking in the rear, just say it. Just make sure they know what they're supposed to be doing. They might not know uh, what they're supposed to be doing exactly. If you say it, they know for sure. There's no excuse that they don't know if you've told them. And that's the best way to avoid a lot of stuff. It's kind of the squad leader's responsibility to make sure that everybody's kind of doing their own thing but he's not going to micromanage you to the point where uh 
where he's telling you which direction to look and stuff like that. Unless he's Tagus. Yeah, who knows, maybe. And then the same thing goes for Team Leader. I mean, the Team Leader is supposed to help you a little bit with that, but it's kind of assumed that you already know which direction you're supposed to be looking. That kind of small communication comes down to the people, every individual. So if you notice that somebody is not looking in the rear or somebody's not covering their sector or something's, you know, somebody's just completely distracted or has tunnel vision or something, just say it over direct communication to them. It's no harm, no foul. It's better that they know than to ignore it. Communication is key. Uh, another thing, that, like, well, the next step, I guess, would be um, scanning. You know, that kind of goes hand in hand with the 360 security. Scanning for targets, pixel hunting. Arm is pretty notorious for that. I mean, you're always looking for very distant enemies with your bare eyeballs, looking for some kind of movement. Now, if you've got head bob on for some reason and you're running around with your squad and you're trying to identify a, you know, a hostile fire team or squad that's 800 meters away, 900 meters away, it's going to be really, really difficult because everything is moving around on your screen and they are just barely moving along. But if you don't have head bob, it makes it a lot easier, but you're still moving. Those things close to you in your vision as you're moving are going to be moving a lot quicker, obviously, than the things that are more further away. So you can be running in one straight direction, look off to your left or something, and notice something moving. The easiest way to increase how you can see if something is moving is if you don't turn your head. You've got your vision fixed on the left, and you are running straight. You're not moving at all except for your, you know, your motion forward and your head is perfectly still looking to the left, you will notice movement a lot better rather than doing a scan, moving your mouse back and forth, left and right, left and right. It would be a lot more effective if you just keep your head still. Kind of track in one direction, you don't see anything, move to a different direction, don't see anything, keep doing that. The best way to improve that even further is to not be moving whatsoever. If you are still and your head is still, you'll be able to see any kind of movement. You'll be able to pick up those, you know, like a, a rabbit off in the distance or, you know, sometimes a sheep or some shit moving around and it's going to throw you off because you wouldn't have noticed that otherwise. But now that you're staying still and you've got your head still, you see that tiny little bit of movement. And that's also how you, you know, if somebody says something like they see an enemy squad moving, you know, 1,200 meters away and you're like, what the fuck? How can they see 1,200 meters away with their naked eyeballs or something like that? That's because they're not moving. They are staying still. They're zoomed in by holding the right mouse button, and they can see tiny little pixels dancing around off in the distance. It's just little things like that. I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory and kind of uh, kind of obvious, but some people don't do that. They just kind of run around and get a little distracted and uh, think things are just going to pop up right in front of them. But no, you got to hunt for stuff if you want to see it before it sees you. That's a lesson a lot of us, uh, people that have been around for a while, learned when the only map available was Stratus. And Stratus is a very small, hilly map. And if you're not paying attention in that map, things can come over the hills at you very, very quickly. And situations can get bad very, very quickly. Luckily, we don't, we're not stuck on one map anymore. We have a lot of different terrains. Uh, so we have a lot more open ground, like things like Takistan and stuff, where you can see very far away. But the example still shines. Uh, just be ready for anything and keep your head on a swivel. Keep your peepers popped, as they say. <laughs> All right. How about uh, using optics to scan? If you've got anything over like a four times magnification, like an ACOG, binoculars, sniper scope, anything like that, and you're just using that to look around for targets, you're going to get tunnel vision really, really hard. You're going to focus with fine detail on certain little things, but you're going to miss a ton of other things. 
Uh, if you're a marksman, that's okay because you know your job is to kind of have tunnel vision on one specific thing. But for everybody else, you want to alternate. You want to use your eyeballs or you know like one times magnification, just regular eyes, scan around just like you would normally with 360 security or whatever. And then if you have binoculars or something and you want to see something in further detail, either call out somebody that has an ACOG or you know some kind of optic, some kind of magnification binoculars or use yours yourselves if you have some, but don't get fix on it or fixated on it for too long. You'll just get stuck looking in one direction. You'll forget that you need to be looking in a bunch of different directions and then things will surprise you. A lot of people, I mean, that sounds really obvious, but a lot of people just forget to do that. Like they'll just run around and use their ACOG to look at everything if they have one. And sure, that gives you good magnification, like four times or whatever, at whatever you're looking at. It'll give you nice detail. But you miss everything around what you're not looking at. You miss the things below it, above it, you know, to the right and left. Versus if you're using your eyeballs, you'll be able to get the general picture of what's going on around it, no matter what. You won't really miss anything. You just won't get the fine detail. And if you notice something and you can't get the fine detail, just do exactly what we just said and use it or figure out somebody that has the ability to do it. I don't know, I just see a lot of other people running around like with binoculars all the time or, you know, magnified optics only, or you see like people playing ops like videos of it or something like that. And they're just purely using their ACOG, looking at doorways and houses and stuff like that from 10 meters away. <laughs> I don't know, it'll get you messed up. It's just a bad habit. All right, give me one minute. I only have a little bit left. Nighttime. Nighttime shit. My favorite ops. Yeah, if it's dusk, if it's nighttime, <sighs> if it's early morning, the rules all kind of apply the same. I mean, you'll see like light sources, like chem lights and stuff like that won't really show up during the day. But if it's later at night, nighttime, or early morning, you'll see them just fine. But anyway, uh, if you're playing an op at nighttime, uh, whether you have night vision or not, you should be looking around for key things uh, that you'll notice at nighttime that you won't notice at any other time during the day. And those things are things like uh, headlights on vehicles. Most vehicles have headlights. Um, if they are unaware of your position, typically they'll be driving around with headlights on. That's a really easy way to spot an enemy vehicle or something along those lines, like an enemy base or encampment or observation post or something. Look for light sources that look like they're moving or don't look like they belong. It's a key way for things to pop out and you to identify things at night. Even though when you're using night vision at nighttime, everything, you know, becomes kind of monochrome, all green. You don't get a whole lot of um, spatial awareness with night vision. That's just kind of the way it is. But things like that, moving objects, uh, light sources, things like that are things you should be looking out for. And then we kind of talked about it earlier, but uh, the next thing is obviously IR lasers. Um, most of the time, if it's a night up, you'll typically be given IR lasers. You shouldn't have those on all the time. They're not designed for that purpose to just leave them on and run around with them. Their purpose is to identify things. Um, if you've got an IR laser at night, you see a target, but you can't quite call out the exact specifics of where it is. You do your regular contact report and then you turn on your IR laser and say something like on my laser or something. And you just keep it on for a couple of seconds until the other people can identify where it is. And then you either turn it off or engage with it on and then turn it off. But you don't want to leave it on. Especially if it's a TVT, you know, like if you're thinking about it, if it's a TVT, you'll almost never want to turn it on. But you should be thinking about that in a sort of similar light, even if it's a co-op. It's just bad practice to run around with a, with a laser on all the time. But that being said, the laser is a pretty useful tool. Uh, if you come across like a squad that looks like they're friendly at nighttime, but you can't really communicate with them, say they're not responding or something like that, 
uh, point a laser at them, you know, flash it a couple times, see if they respond to it, see if they flash a laser back at you or something like that. If they do, then you know, that's a form of communication. You just basically said, hey, we're friendly. That's a really easy way to avoid friendly fire incidents or something like that. Instead of just saying, oh, there's, it kind of looks like a friendly squad out there. We can't really communicate with them. Oh, well, let's just keep going. And then five minutes later, they all shoot you. It's an easy way to just identify each other. Um, like we said earlier, in rare situations, the AI does use laser pointers. So don't assume that all laser pointers are, are friendly. But most of the time they are. Um, it doesn't happen very often, but, uh, you know, every once in a while, if you, uh, say you jip or you get lost or something like that, and you need to find your squad at night and they're relatively close to you, but you don't know exactly where, uh, call in on your short range if you have one and ask them to like put an IR laser in the sky for a second or two. You'll get a general idea of like where the fuck was that? I just relative to you. You know, this is where I am. It helps. Uh, flashlights. What? Somebody say something. Native Ghost Rider. Flashlights are actually pretty useful. Uh, not in like every situation, obviously, but uh, they have their purpose and they do it pretty well. If you're in a close quarter situation, a light does help quite a bit, even if you do have night vision. Um, in TVT, it helps quite a bit. If you turn it on at the last second in a close quarter situation and you put it right in somebody's face, they might know where you are, but they can't see your silhouette of your body. They just see kind of a light source right in their face, and that might buy you a split second to engage somebody that you didn't have before. So lights really do, uh, they work pretty well. The vanilla flashlights that we get in this game are pretty shitty though. They're not very bright, um, and they're just kind of annoying. Uh, but the content pack ones that we have, and we have quite a few of them, are very effective. They are quite a bit brighter than the vanilla flashlights, and they kick some ass if you're in an enclosed space. Especially if you don't have night vision. Um, just like the lasers, enemies will sometimes use flashlights at night, and that'll be a really easy way to identify enemies. If, like, you know, a couple people, two, three, four, five, have flashlights on and they're kind of jumping around in a certain direction, you won't have like a hundred percent positive ID, but you can have a pretty good guarantee that uh, that they're going to be hostile. So that's that's something along with you know headlights, flashlights kind of go hand in hand as identifiers at nighttime to see enemies or you know something out there, something to look out for. Uh, and just like the IR lasers, you can use it as a really crude form of communication to another squad. Uh, just flash a, a flashlight at them a couple times, maybe they'll see it. That's about it for flashlights. Also at nighttime, if uh, if you're in a city and there's a bunch of street lights around, don't just go around shooting the street lights. You, you should have a good reason to be doing that. And if if you if you do want to continue shooting street lights, ask the squad leader or whatever. If he says it's fine, then yeah, go for it. It might be helpful because they might be really bright lights at during like night vision times or whatever, like in the pitch of night or something. But don't just go around doing it on your own, shooting every light that you see. People are going to freak out and hear your fire and think, you know, what's going on. Nice jump. Yeah, I will know where you are. But anyway, not a really big deal. Just something to, to keep in mind. Uh, and just a note about chem lights, too. Chem lights are different in their color. The red chem lights have a much shorter... Uh, distance of being able to see them illuminate stuff than blue chem lights. Blue chem lights have the longest range. I don't remember the exact um, exact values for it, but in real life, it's something like a chem light is a red chem light is visible from only like 25 meters away or something like that, and a blue chem light is up to like 100 or something. Just because uh, those 
you know, whatever color bands are uh, travel further with blue or something. It's a short wavelength versus the long ones with red or something. I don't know. That's why they use red flashlights instead of white or blue flashlights or whatever. It's because red light doesn't dilate your pupils. Yeah, that too. And you can't see it from further away. But that being said, don't throw chem lights on everybody in your squad if it's a nighttime mission. It's it's not a good uh, not a good habit to form. It doesn't necessarily do anything negative, but if you're using some kind of 3D optic and you've got a bunch of chem lights around you, they will act as light sources and they will cause uh, reflections to show up on your optics. And sometimes that can just make them completely unusable. So keep that in mind. Um, if, if you're like you have a squad leader and they say, you know, go ahead, use chem lights, then do it. But if somebody asks you to take it off because it's obstructing something that they're doing, then just respect that. Chem lights can fuck up your day at nighttime. If you're trying to engage something and all you can see is a reflection and they're shooting you, it's a pain in the ass. Doc, are you telling people to be nice with one another? Yes, I am. Wow. Unacceptable. Be excellent to each other. I don't know. This is kind of dragging on, so I'll just do one last point. Uh, lanes of fire. Say you're all engaged in something, especially in a town. Say you're in a town, you're peeking around a corner, you're engaged in something. Uh, and somebody else, like say you're crouched and peeking around a corner or something. Somebody else really wants to get into that engagement as well. They want to be shooting what you're shooting at. So they peek around the same corner and they're standing. So they're kind of shooting over your head and then uh, you're shooting at this target or whatever. And the crouching guy gets shot. You know, he'd say he takes one bullet in the arm or something like that. He's like, oh, fuck, I got to pull out. And he stands up and immediately takes a bullet in the back of the head. And that happens all the time. That and then the other really, uh, really common situation is being prone and then crouching or something like that. Like, say you call out a contact and everybody in the squad is ready to engage it or it's kind of a last minute thing. Everybody goes prone and starts engaging stuff, and instead of spreading out in sort of a line to engage things, they just go prone wherever they were and start engaging things. And what that means is a lot of people were in front of back of each other, and they start going prone and trying to engage things, so they're shooting, you know, less than a meter away from each other. Sometimes that's not a problem if everybody knows that that's what's going on, but if it's not communicated, then somebody could easily roll or stand up or move real quickly and just take a bunch of bullets. So if you're going to be doing something along those lines, you have to communicate to one each other that, you know, you're firing very close to them. Or if you need to move away from where you currently are, you know, yell that you are crossing or something like that. Yell it more than once as well. Say you need to get inside of a wall or something and there's one opening and you've got a friendly shooting out of that opening and you need to get in there. Just yell crossing like three times really quickly. Uh, try to get a, like some kind of response. Make sure there's a pause in their fire or something and then cross. You might not always get a response back, but that's much better than saying nothing and running in. Nice. Is that uh, it? Yeah, pretty much. That's kind of everything I wanted to cover. Nice. You guys are just on your shitter rolls today. Best behavior. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions or anything they just want to kind of like cover that I just forgot to talk about? I don't really care. We could talk about anything. Your medic should not be at the front of the How squad. When will Trotsky fix this mode? 240s, oh man. Give me two well, of them ducks are, out. Yeah, it ducks are risen. They need to have virtual arsenal for us. They need people man. who don't use the filthy ammo box to this broken. Entire thing. I drank two of them. Fucking casual. How do you do guided A-10 bombings? Yeah, is that a real question? Lays it. 420 lays it, faggot. <laughs> I mean, I, whenever I drink about 440s, I'm pretty, I'm like, I'm annihilated, usually. 
Well, yeah, that's probably has something to do with the sheer volume of liquid that you've just consumed, because that's stupid. Why the fuck would you drink two 440s? Even I wouldn't do that, and I'm black. <laughs> I'm really? black, y'all, and I'm black. Really? And just I'm get black. some fucking liquor black, with your 40, <laughs> man. It's, it's easy. Yeah, come on, Wait, man. What? I don't give a fuck. Some cognac. McVolka, you're out of line. Cognac? Hell yeah, I'll drink that too. <laughs> Doesn't annoy me, I'm pushing no more. Let's drink some fucking oh, yeah. vodka. No fun Don't allowed. Anyway, no fun know. allowed. My mouth is watering <laughs> with this conversation. Does anybody have any legitimate questions about, I don't know. Yeah, what kind of vodka do you drink? I only drink Stolishnia. I only drink Stolishnia too. I'm eating fortune cookies, dude. Let me tell you what the I fortune had a question. is. Give me two How seconds do you find your current elevation? Current elevation? In uh, what? Your vehicle? GPS will tell you that if you have a GPS. And that's kind of convenient. Also, that is something watch. that I kind of forgot. Yeah, there's that altimeter, but um, that's pretty but uncommon to have it nowadays dagger. since we have TFR and everything gets replaced with a fucking radio program. Work at your location on the map and make use of the map contours. Yeah, that, that's really useful as well. If you know exactly where you are on the map, level. just mouse over it and you have that little indication right next to your kind of crosshair. Do you know that's the proper algorithm for subtracting elevation from your zeroing? Fuck off. What the fuck is wrong with you? Anyway, uh, how do you use that up the on your own time? zeroing on the RHS vehicles? I think it's RHS vehicles. Uh, yeah. AGM has a fire control system that's kind of built into kind of everything. Yep. It just kind of controls everything at this point. Talking about the Russian vehicles or the... Yeah, the Russian ones. Not like... The Russian vehicles yeah. don't oh, have Oh, you're talking about like T-72s and shit. You just have to shit. read the scope. You need to read yeah. the site. Yeah, that's oh. different. Russian optics are very special. Every Russian optic is special. They don't seem to fire accurately anyway, so... They work. They, yeah, because it's they Russian. compensate... For the swaying of a drunk operator, the horizontal. They do have horizontal movement compensation, which seems to, at least from my experience, end up end up being broken and shooting like a way off. Yeah, you, that's that's one of those things. I mean, you got to learn how Russian optics work as far as like why they chose that reticle and what each thing means in that reticle. For instance, the RPGs and stuff like that. You, but you on top of that, of you have to yourself. consider that it's a video game as well, and then there's deviation, and some things anyway, are wrong, and you just have to compensate the for it. T-72s and T-80s, you turn on your laser, which is uh, cycled with the F key, um, and then you point at the target, and then you hold your target button. I don't know if it's T or right mouse button for you, depending on your controls, and the little zero onto it. Maybe, uh, maybe at some point I'll do... Like a training thing for unguided. Oh, hang on. Just let me yell. Oh, I am yelling. Maybe one thing I'll do at one point. I'll do a training thing for uh, dumb fire rockets. But um, for the you RPG guys don't know seven, how to do unguided. Shut up. For RPG sevens, one thing really quick is the only there's only Pretty one much. round I think there's that works with the iron sights, and that's the PG seven V. Every other round, you either need this, you either need you know to know it offhand it like I do. Or you need the uh, Bad ups. one of the two scopes to fire them accurately. Yep. Yeah, that's something so I'd like to see a... is a, a video of the uh, uh, RPG Seven with all the optics. That would be a perfect yeah. A3G well, the video. optics are the optics are really simple. Like the first one is yeah, but you got to you got to memorize it. Yeah, make it. It's yeah, simple yeah, when you have it memorized. But when you like, if you sure pick up a V3 optic and you can't remember what the symbols were for which ones they correlate, like which one's a tandem and which one's a VL or whatever, pretty, you're fine. Pretty sure I made a quick reference for the AKP RPG7 and ammunition drops. Nobody cares, man. I don't know if it. I don't know if it works the same for the RHS one. I'll just post it in the thread. Link. I don't know about the RHS one. It probably is pretty damn close. But yeah, you should make a. You guys should make a video out of it. Videos apply way more than a little infra, like infographics and stuff. I know people see the infographics a lot more in like a thread because you can really easily post them. But the videos are permanent. It's nice. All right, well, I'm going to the store before ops. Yeah, same. <laughs>